In 1979, Moonraker sent James Bond into space, sent box office records soaring, and sent movie budgets into hyperdrive. It was about as sustainable as a petrol-powered smartphone, and the Bond series would need to come down to Earth for his next adventure, for your eyes only. In 1981, For Your Eyes Only was the embodiment of gravity at work. What goes up must come down, unless you don't choose to believe in scientific concepts like gravity, in which case, what goes up goes on forever and ever and ever until the magic pixies say otherwise. Bond had his own form of magic pixie, producer Albert R. Cubby Broccoli. He decided he did not want to chase Moonraker's massive success with an even bigger budget, but instead reorient the spy series for the 1980s. In the 70s, if you wanted to market something as being cool, you would put some bollocks in your ad as something something the 80s. In this new grounded Bond film, there would be almost no gadgets, much less goofy humour, and no cretinous henchmen who these days wouldn't get past the phone screener with henchmen resources. The 80s was considered a brave new frontier with wonderful and terrifying new technologies. In reality though, for most people, this just meant complaining about how hard it was to set the timer on your VCR to record Dallas. Did he leave any notes? They could help us. No, I don't think so. A new decade brought with it a new director. John Glenn had edited and directed second unit sequences for several Bond films and was seen as the perfect man to handle a more grounded film series. Glenn would go on to direct all five official Bond movies released during the 1980s with various degrees of critical and financial success. Roger Moore was, by this time, not under contract, so there was a possibility for a time that Bond would again need to be recast. If you looked around at who was hitting big around 1980, there weren't as many obvious candidates for Bond. Moore and Broccoli came to terms with Roger Moore back for another adventure, which then meant then there was now the tiresome business of having to come up with an exciting film. And as all of Ian Fleming's novels had now been spoken for, it was time to look at Ian Fleming's shorts. The film would be based partly on two of Fleming's short stories, For Your Eyes Only and Risico, and would include a sequence that had originally appeared in the book of Live and Let Die. And 007, try not to muck it up again. A British spy ship is sunk in its magical war MacGuffin, the ATAC is lost at sea. ATAC, despite looking across between a Hi-Fi amp and an Atari 2600, was vital to Britain's defence, we're told. Bond is sent to investigate the murder of the British archaeologist who was attempting to recover the MacGuffin on the quiet. Bond heads to Spain to question the assumed killer. But things go pear-shaped when the archaeologist's daughter, Melina, shows up and demonstrates the efficacy of a crossbow dart. Bond's investigations lead him to help Q to create a character for Skyrim, then muck about in northern Italy for a bit, before finally the film heads to Greece for the second half of the movie. Bond's assignment leads him to become involved in the rivalry between two Greek smugglers, Christatos on the one hand and Colombo on the other. Christatos is the sponsor of a teenage ice skating prodigy, while Colombo solves crimes in an old trench coat. Also, while initially posing as helping Bond, Christatos is in fact looking to sell the magical war MacGuffin to the Russians. Bond, Molina and Colombo team up, like three-fifths of Voltron but without the head or right arm, to take out Christatos and stop the Russians from getting the magical war MacGuffin. When we say For Your Eyes Only is more down to earth, we really mean it's more down to earth than Moonraker, which really isn't hard. For Your Eyes Only spends a lot of time either in the air or underwater, but again, Bond doesn't make much use of gadgetry. He loses one Lotus early in the movie and drives a replacement later on, but only as transport. He also drives Molina's 2CV in a thrilling chase through olive groves and a mini submarine. But for the most part, this is Bond or more accurately Roger Moore's stuntman climbing mountains, skiing, mucking about in boats or being keel hauled. While Roger Moore is more and more obviously not doing the hard stuff, he does stand in front of an aggressively fake back projection screen with style. Moore does get probably the hardest scene of his version of Bond. <laughs> Apparently, Roger Moore really wasn't that keen on kicking the car over the cliff, but it gives his Bond a badass moment that's been lacking for so much of the late 70s and 80s. Had no head for heights. Moore plays Bond as he has always done, but in a nod to advancing years, they finally give Bond a love interest that Roger pushes back on. Skater Lynn Holly Johnson plays a thirsty skater who's really, really got daddy issues, and Bond, for one of the few times that I can recall, doesn't reciprocate when a grown woman, or in this case a not-so-grown woman, throws themselves at him. 
I don't think your Uncle Ari would approve. Him? He thinks I'm still a virgin. Yes, well, you get your clothes on. I'll buy you an ice cream. French actress Carol Bouquet plays an Englishman's idealised version of a Greek woman and is probably the last major Bond star to have their voice replaced by a voiceover artist during post-production. But I'm half Greek. And Greek women like Electra always avenge their loved ones. Melina has the dead eye stare of someone intent on revenge, but there seems to be about as much chemistry between Moore and Bouquet as rock and paper. The best thing I can say about Bouquet is she does the determined stare very well. That dubbed voice though seems to work against her in every scene. I was lucky to find you. You left Crete so suddenly. It's like watching Andy Kaufman miming to Mighty Mouse, but this time the audience isn't laughing. Bouquet was also not fond of going underwater, so in some clever movie magic, all of the underwater close-ups of Bond and Molina were filmed in a normal studio in slow motion with a fan blowing Bouquet's locks around while some bubbles are added later. Julian Glover, recognisable from roles in Doctor Who, Game of Thrones and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, is possibly the least interesting Bond villain to date and he manages to just stay ahead of Bond for most of the film, more by luck and timing than anything else. Normally, a great addition to any cast given his authoritative sneer, Glover seems miscast as the heavy. One of his underlings in this film, a young Charles Dance, would prove to be excellent in this type of role years later. You may have to kill him. Does this discourage you? Colombo, played by Topol, will prove to be a better match for a Bond film. Colombo is charismatic and a boon to the pistachio industry, and he's the only convincing Greek character in the film. I'm a good judge of men. Mr. Bond, you have what the Greeks call thrasos, guts. So have you, Mr. Colombo. It's actually been a while since Bond had help from a charismatic local character, and this is one of the few times that person wasn't offed at the end of Act 2. Like poor Luigi. Don't play with any of the switches, will you? Right. For Your Eyes Only doesn't really exhibit major problems in any one area, but it doesn't have enough oomph where it counts. It's a slickly made thriller, mostly well acted with some lovely cinematography, but it's not particularly charming. It's like an Instagram model's autobiography. Even some of the lesser entries feel more watchable in that they don't try to suck all the fun out of the settings, like For Your Eyes Only seems determined to do at times, all in the name of keeping things grounded. Now, when I say suck the fun out of the film, I mean it's like a tire with a small puncture that slowly deflates over the weekend, rather than explosive decompression. For Your Eyes Only was a film that was trying to be a Cold War thriller, but one whose main character was a guy who wore a dinner jacket wherever possible, a man whose car turned into a submarine, and whose watch was either a bomb, communications device, or marital aid. It could have been worse, but it could have been better. It's like ordering a supreme pizza, but asking for them to hold the pepperoni, sausage, peppers, onions, and sauce. The film does have a great title song, sung by Sheena Easton, who actually appears in the title sequence, but the rest of the musical score is awful. Bill Conti, who'd written the music for Rocky, and who was for decades the leader of the orchestra at award ceremonies like the Oscars, and he provides a score that was neither up to date nor timeless. It has dated pretty poorly. It's not disco enough nor is it 80s enough. Bright, popping brass and synthesizers make the film sound like a TV ad for winter tires rather than a blockbuster action film. Pierce Brosnan first came to the attention of Bond producers during the production of this film when he visited the set to watch Roger Moore kissing his first wife, Cassandra Harris. Awkward. Q appears several times in welcome appearances and Moneypenny briefly at the start. Bernard Lee had passed away after Moonraker and for now we have a few stopgap characters to fill in for M in this one film. That's totally not meant to be Blofeld. I mean, it was, but legal issues prevented him from being named as such and Oh, look at the cute kitty. For Your Eyes Only isn't terrible or dull. It's just missing something. It's like buying a brand new car without any coolant in the radiator. While it looks great, whether it's in your driveway or stuck by the side of the road waiting for a tow truck after the radiator exploded, you just wish they'd splurged on a bottle of coolant. For your eyes only, darling.
the film was successful enough. Not a Moonraker style smash, but I don't think they were seriously expecting a smaller film to do the same sort of box office. Another Bond film was scheduled for 1983. Roger Moore would again prove slippery to sign, and there was trouble on the horizon with Sean Connery coaxed into making a rival Bond movie due for a release around the same time. Who would win in what was dubbed by some idiots as the Battle of the Bonds? If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.